So hi everyone, my name is Jade Werger. I'm the Sport Development Coordinator for Sportability BC. Uh, I would like to thank the Disability Foundation for inviting me to present today and tell you about our organization and what we do um, and hopefully uh, provide you with some information about adaptive sport that will uh, draw your interest. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen for uh, this presentation. Uh, and I just have it on another screen, so I'll be looking there. Um, so hopefully uh, you don't feel disengaged, but I'll try and look back and forth. So um, again, this is uh, where sportability. Uh, so um, we'll talk today about adapted sport development in British Columbia and kind of different ways you can get involved and what opportunities are out there that might appeal to you. So Sportability is a registered uh, charity. So we provide, our goal is to provide um, adaptive sports for British Columbians with physical disabilities across the province. And that's anywhere from recreation. So somebody may be trying it for the first time all the way up to providing pathways or streams uh, for competitive levels and those seeking that pathway. Uh, we're very volunteer driven. So in terms of coaches, um, general volunteers, events, programs, uh, that really helps with us and allowing us to offer these programs to our athletes um, in BC. So we oversee three sports, uh, boccia, para ice hockey, or better known as sledge hockey, and power chair soccer. Uh, so today I'm going to focus on th those three sports. We also do oversee uh, what's called, or what was called seven aside soccer, now para soccer, uh, which is a stand up version of soccer that's uh, adapted for people with physical disabilities. So who might be, um, have the ability to run uh, or walk, but maybe their disability impairs that a little bit um, to feel comfortable participating in mainstream sports. So um, I won't be focusing on that sport today, but if there's any questions about that, you can definitely send me an email and we can discuss more. So Bacha, I always describe it as a Paralympic version of Bocce, uh, but for those who don't know Bocce, um, Bacha is an indoor sport uh, typically played in a gym and the goal of the game in short is to get your colored either red bocce ball or blue bocce ball closest to the target white ball called the jack to score points. So similar scoring to curling if people are familiar with that. Um, and this was a sport originally designed for people with severe cerebral palsy but is now open to people with a wide variety of uh, disabilities. So I'll get into classification a bit later, uh, but basically in Botch at the recreation level and speaking to what we offer um, in BC, it's really open to anybody with or without a disability um, and people without, so maybe somebody who's able-bodied or doesn't have a um, disability that affects their ability to roll, throw the ball, uh, would be placed in what we call an open class. Um, and then that goes all the way up to um, different classifications based on the person's uh, mobility and um, how that affects their throwing or rolling technique. So in the top right corner picture here with the, with the individual with the ramp, uh, that's considered a BC3 class, and that's somebody who uses a hand pointer or a head pointer um, and a ramp to participate in the sport. And in this picture, you can see there's uh, somebody beside this individual playing, and that's called a sport assistant. So that sport assistant is basically a piece of equipment for that athlete. So um, this particular sport assistant would help um, that athlete adjust the ramp uh, depending on where he decides he would like that shot to aim. So they're not making that decision for that person, but they're there as a piece of equipment to help that person play. Um, so it really gives that autonomy to people uh, who are in the BC3 or ramp class. Uh, you could also see in the bottom right hand corner, that's a referee. Um, so she's measuring the distance between the bocce balls uh, the red and the blue to see who's closer to score the points. So in this case, if red was closer um, in this particular picture, it looks like they would have one red ball closer to the jack uh, compared to the next blue ball to score one point for that end. In a botcha game, there's 
typically four ends for um, individual play and uh, the points are carried over to each end. Uh, in Botcher, you can play as an individual, you can play as pairs, or you can play as teams of three. Uh, and in the teams of three, that's where the combination of uh, BC ones and twos are together and BC uh, four and fives are together. So it, it, it typically, it, so in BC, again, going back at our recreational tournaments, we don't necessarily worry about a classification at certain events. And then there's other events where it's more competitive and we do have classifiers come in and uh, classify athletes to participate in a uh, particular group. And the reason for classification is just to be competing against other athletes who have this, who are playing on the same uh, skill level or ability level. Okay, so some adaptive equipment for botches. So at that last site, slide I talked about uh, the ramps. So these top two pictures are ramps that uh, sportability carries to bring to different uh, triads or to have on hand for people who might need to borrow the equipment. Um, as athletes get more involved in the sport, they can purchase their own custom ramp and they're quite, uh, they're quite interesting because you can have the ramp up super high if you're looking for that power on certain shots um, and that's where the head pointers would come in to push the ball down the ramp um, and uh, yeah you can really individualize it and that when I say head pointer you can see there's a picture in the bottom left corner of that and the bottom right corner is just an example of a hand pointer that somebody might use. In the middle that's a botcha set uh, so that's what a typical botcha set looks like you have six red botcha balls and six blue botcha balls and a jack. Um, and depending on what the game is and the coin flip of who's uh, gonna be which color, um, you then get to pick that. So uh, with our botcha sets and, and what's good to have on the botcha court while playing are uh, botcha balls that are of different hardness. So um, some botcha balls, if they're hard, medium or soft, uh, that allows you to execute uh, certain shots better. So if you're looking to knock a ball away, you would use your hard botcha ball. Um, but if you're looking to kind of lob and land a ball close to the jack, then that's where maybe a softball would come in. Okay, our next sport we'll move on to is power chair soccer. And I just have a video here, uh, which just gives everyone a good idea of uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, and just a heads up, um, hopefully your volume is adjusted uh, just so it's not too loud for you. Um, so if you want to adjust your volume now and then I'll click play on the video. video because it gives everyone a better sense of uh, you know what the sport looks like live and and uh, and just gives a better picture versus me just describing it so um, power soccer is played in a gym as you saw in the video 
three on three with a goalie in each net um, and is has a lot of soccer rules um, similar to mainstream soccer in place, uh, but also has power soccer specific rules to uh, kind of help with just safety of the sport and um, and just kind of the, the culture of the sport. So in that video, you probably noticed the power chairs used were a very different than your everyday uh, chair that you would see. Um, so that's called a strike force chair and that's a power soccer sport specific chair. And you can see that in the bottom left hand corner here. So those chairs, um, a lot of people that are invested in the sport will purchase them and and adjust the chair to meet their needs and allow them to play. Uh, so, but at the same time, not everybody uh, who plays a sport uses a, a strike force chair and are able to use their daily chair um, to play the sport. So that kind of is what you're seeing in these pictures here. Uh, so the top two pictures are actually a recent um, guard that Sportability um, has manufactured kind of on our own and based on what the um, the equipment that's out there and where we were seeing some barriers. So uh, Vancouver Power Soccer Club actually came up with this design originally and uh, we were able to use it at a try it event um, and found that it was a really easy, quick uh, way to, adapt, uh, to attach a guard to people's chairs um, that allowed people to try the sport. Um, so the plastic guard itself is uh, purchased at Power Soccer Shop uh, out in Minnesota. And then what we did was um, had L brackets and flat bars um, made and, and uh, were able to uh, create this kind of what we call a universal guard, um, like I said, for quick adaption. Uh, and really it attaches just, you can see on the foot plate there, and then there's just a long screw through. Uh, and then we just use wing nuts to kind of tighten the guard. Um, and so far it's worked well. And the reason we designed this is because we were finding the, the attachments that are out there um, was one really time consuming to attach. Uh, two, if we were going to see somebody new, we didn't really know what their chair was like and what attachments they would need. And three, if they were a center, what we call a center mount attachment where the guard has to attach um, to the chair in the center part um, because there's no uh, foot posts on the person's chair, that that was really tricky. Um, so there are the center mounts and uh, in this picture down here of the plastic guard, you can see the clamps, uh, what we call side mount guards uh, that are plastic available. Uh, but we're really finding the universal guard uh, that we've developed here is so far so good and um, something that we're hoping we can use for uh, group triad events um, and uh, different programs to get people started. So down in the right hand corner that's a metal guard um, and you can see there's brackets there on the side as well and typically what we do and support people is first start with the plastic power soccer guard um, to see if they are interested in the sport um, and if they're going to stick with it and they can use that as a temporary kind of guard um, and if they are really interested in the sport and uh, wanting to play, you know, long term, then we, we work with people to uh, look at metal guards and the attachments on there, which are a little more customization. And our friends at Tetra Society um, have helped us with adapting and making personal brackets uh, for these metal guards for participants that are seen uh, to stay in the sport a long time. Um, the reason the metal guards are a bit better is they're a little more sturdier um, and just easier to control the ball. So yeah, both the plastic guards and metal guards are equipment that people can attach to their daily use chair versus purchasing a strike force chair, which can be pretty pricey. Um, you would then have another chair and uh, you know, you would have to store that and everything as well too. So those are kind of the uh, options for uh, if you're using your daily use chair. Uh, and then the video too, you saw the soccer ball. So, um, the soccer ball is a 13 inch power soccer ball. So just bigger than a uh, mainstream soccer ball you would see uh, today.
Okay, so our next sport is pair ice hockey, or some of you might know it better as sledge hockey. Uh, so I'll show you a video from our women's development camp that we had a few years ago uh, to get a sense of what the sport looks like. Okay. Let's go. Before we press to empower ourselves to feel good and have a great self esteem about what we can do at our Okay, so uh, hopefully it gives you a bit of an idea of the sports. So uh, for anybody who's interested in stand-up hockey, uh, the para ice hockey is, is exactly the same rules with some minor um, rules added to this that pertain to the sport particularly. Um, and it's really just the adaptive version of stand-up ice hockey. Uh, so I have these pictures here so you can see the different kind of setups and different types of sleds and the sticks. Uh, so in the video, you noticed uh, how you may have noticed how people were pushing themselves on the ice to gain speed. Uh, so that's with the the stick. So there's two uh, sticks that pair ice hockey players use. Uh, I kind of describe them as mini hockey sticks. And then at the with one end, it has a blade uh, to control the puck. And at the other end, there's uh, ice picks, and that's used to dig into the ice um, to gain that momentum to push yourself for speed. Uh, on the left uh, top hand corner here, you can see this sledge set up uh, with this person who has a double leg amputation. Uh, so you can see there's a bit of a bucket on that they put on their legs uh, to help protect themselves. And um, whereas other people who may be, say, a single leg amputee, able-bodied, um, or have a spinal cord injury, they would just put shin pads over their legs to uh, protect themselves. Uh, and then you can also see in that picture as well, the sled, uh, what we call the nose. So kind of this, uh, kind of the poles that uh, can extend based on your height. Um, those have come in for uh, this individual and that just allows for better, better agility and uh, balance of weight on the ice uh, for them. And then uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, that's typically what a sled looks like. So you have uh, the nose piece at the end, uh, where you would put your feet, and then you have the um, the poles there, so that extends for your uh, for your height and comfort, and then the bucket in which you would sit in with the two straps that cross your body uh, to hold you in place. So in the right uh, picture hand picture over here, uh, these are kind of this is a slide that's just set up with different adaptions. So I like to show this for people that. Uh, might require different different uh, setup in their sled uh, based on their needs. So you can see on this one, there's a higher back. Uh, so maybe somebody who doesn't have the core stability uh, to keep themselves upright in the sled or just needs a little support with that. Uh, that's where a high back can come in as well as the chest straps. Um, there is a head support as well that can be attached. And um, at the back here, there's uh, what we call a push bar. So that would be for somebody who uh, maybe wants to get on the ice and participate, uh, but has a hard time holding on to the sticks uh, to push themselves and, and therefore can play with somebody skating behind them and pushing them on the ice. Uh, so this is also great even for um, people that, you know, say kids that want to go on a skating field trip with their, their classmates, um, but maybe need a little support uh, participating on the ice, then they can have that helper behind them, uh, pushing them along there. Uh, we found we have found too, like, again with like our recreation programs, this um, you don't necessarily have to be a, have a specific disability um, to participate. And like I mentioned, even um, sledge hockey, we we often have a lot of able-bodied uh, participants playing. 
um, which it helps with numbers. And um, a lot of people often start um, playing sledge hockey if, say, they have a friend or a family member uh, who has a disability and um, plays a sport, and then they brought along their able-bodied friend and they love it and just kind of stuck around. So um, really open to everybody. And uh, as you can imagine, and I, I kind of touched on it a little bit, to participate independently, uh, that core strength and um, finger and hand dexterity uh, would be there, but it's not to say you couldn't get on the ice um, and make personal adaptions uh, to participate at a level that you feel comfortable with. So um, we've done everything from even, you know, duct taping um, gloves for people that uh, just need a little support gripping onto the sticks. Um, and things like that. So it's just really, with all these sports, it's really about getting out there and participating and um, having options available to, to participate in sport. So our programs for these sports, uh, these are just different. This is where uh, non-COVID, where we have active programs that uh, take place on a weekly basis. Um, and these programs are all kind of set up differently. So I didn't want to touch on that. So um, for instance, all of our power soccer programs um, aside from Cologne and Chilliwack, are club-based. So these programs started um, with volunteers, and they they run the clubs and and rent out the space and take care of all of that. Um, whereas Kelowna, um, and we'll just focus on power soccer to make it easy. Kelowna power soccer is run through the municipality. Um, uh, so that's all city run and, and we just keep contact with them to let them know, uh, you know, what's going on and if they can share information with their members. Uh, and then the Chilliwack program is an after school program in Chilliwack. So um, you, there's kind of different ways to to approach programming and setting them up. Um, and we're there to support with um, whether it's uh, equipment or coaching or volunteers. Um, we're kind of there to, to work with partners and support them with that. Um, currently, our Vancouver Bocha program and our Surrey Para Ice Hockey program is a sportability specific program, which means um, that program is directly run under us. Uh, so Vancouver Bocha, for instance, um, we got a volunteer to run that program and train them um, because uh, unfortunately our staff can't be everywhere at once. So that's where the partnerships really come in into place and those community connections um, make a huge difference and uh, I think make our programs more efficient. Uh, so para ice hockey, for instance, that's that has kind of another setup and um, example of different partnerships uh, to get programs going. So uh, for instance, Kamloops and Prince George are uh, run through community, what we kind of call community champions because they really do a great job um, running those programs. And uh, so Kamloops would be uh, Kamloops Adapted Sports Association and Prince George would be Northern Adapted Sports Association. So definitely different approaches to take uh, to really get program going, uh, whether that's working with municipalities, working with community partners, um, having them club-based, uh, they're kind of different approaches and, and, and also that after school one, as I mentioned, Chilliwack, um, different approaches. They all, they all have their pros and cons and uh, they all, I find, work uh, depending on the community and depending on uh, the support systems that are available and, and they're in place. So outside of our weekly programming, uh, these are things that we usually do on an annual basis. So uh, I touched on tried events. So basically that's, you know, if we host a day um, out in a community or we partner with um, different groups like uh, we've done GF Strong and LifeMark um, and so on, um, that's just a day where we come out and we introduce a sport um, and people are able to try it in a relaxed environment and, and ask questions and learn about the sport. Uh, introductory programs, that's where we're kind of trying to lead to. Uh, not that try it days are a bad, but um, it's kind of a one-off day and the introductory programs uh, is a little more beneficial, I find, for people to really get an understanding for the sport. And what these are are four to eight week programs um, where we partner with different groups and we can come into the facility and run 
you know, a four to eight week program once a week with the same participants. So they're really able to get a good, um, a good idea of the sport and then decide if, you know, that sports for them and if they want to then go and attend one of our um, programs that happen weekly in their community. Um, I will mention too, on that list on the last slide, if you didn't see a program within your community or one that's close by, that's not to say you can't participate in the sport. And I'll get into that a little bit. Uh, I think it's in the next slide a little bit later. Um, but I just wanted to address that because sometimes people get turned away uh, saying, well, there's not an active program going for me. But what you can do is either email myself or uh, one of our staff members and just say, hey, I'm interested in this sport. Um, you know, is there how can I participate type of thing or how can we potentially get something going in my community or community close by? Um, I really encourage people to do that because I don't know where everyone is out there that would be interested, right? So um, please do not hesitate to reach out if, if you uh, don't see a, a sport in your community that you'd really like to try. Uh, and then community outreach is other ones. So um, that's with things uh, kind of ties into the triads where, um, you know, we've gone on the ice with LifeMark clients or um, we've gone to GF Strong or Sunny Hill and, and offered triad days, but also we do community outreach where we do presentations like this or in a normal world, we're at different um, different events or, or resource fairs, uh, just letting people know who we are and um, providing information for people uh, if they would like to get involved with sportability or, or our programs. Uh, Multi-sport days. So I had these for uh, Botch and Power Soccer. It was tough. We actually had a multi-sport day scheduled right before COVID hit, um, where we were really looking forward to, uh, where basically we have a day or a weekend where we leave it really loose and open and we invite people out to come and try the sports. Um, and we have more than one sport offered in that day. So we tie Boccia and Power Soccer uh, together because they're both gym sports, whereas Para Ice Hockey, it'd be tough to do a multi-sport day uh, since we need to be on the ice. But we do also offer, uh, or we do also have off ice sleds um, available that we, we do bring to triads and community outreach. So um, we are able to bring those into the gym uh, for multi-sport days as well, where the sleds are just on wheels instead of uh, blades. So it gives a chance for people to try different sports um, and is another way to, you know, hopefully engage people with us. Uh, when we do return to in-person, we are also going to incorporate um, Power Hockey, uh, which is a new sport that's been introduced to us from our friends at Power Hockey Canada. And we think that would be a good tie in and, and just another good option for uh, power chair users. So we're looking forward to kind of bringing some equipment uh, there and just having more options for people to try. And then we get to uh, development camps. So this is for all three sports. These are camps that um, we focus on skill development and usually just incorporate some fun games in there for um, people to get, uh, you know, a chance to meet new people and also just develop their skills uh, outside of their weekly programming. And sometimes we bring in uh, people that talk about equipment, uh, that talk about strength training um, and conditioning uh, and just different resources like that. So people get um, a little more uh, skill development and different resources uh, for their sport. So for Bacha, we uh, have Western Championship, which the goal of we've only been able to offer once because we started that in 2019 and uh, Alberta was going to host 2020, but that's been uh, obviously postponed. Um, but the first tournament was a big hit um, and we're really looking forward to being able to host again and, and work with our partners in Alberta and Manitoba. Uh, but the goal of this tournament was we were seeing there's a gap um, for Western uh, Canadian botch athletes. Uh, and so we wanted to have a tournament out West uh, that was competitive and that would allow them uh, to, you know, get that uh, competition experience instead of always having to travel out East. So um, yeah, so that tournament we're really looking forward to having again. Um, sticking with Bacha, provincial tournament we have every year, and that's where we select our provincial team members or those who are interested. Even if people want to attend that tournament for a competition 
um, opportunity and aren't interested on being in a provincial tournament, that's totally fine too. But this is where we kind of make our provincial team selection. Uh, and then from there, the team has provincial team training camps leading up to the Canadian National Championships, which are hosted in different provinces each year. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's a bit of the competitive kind of pathway. Uh, the equipment loan program, again, we have these for all three of our sports, and I touched on a, a, it a little bit in our last slide. Uh, but this is a program, uh, you can find it on our website, that uh, we offer to people who um, I, might have a financial barrier to participate in sport, uh, who might be in a community that doesn't have a program, uh, but they want to participate in the sport. So we loan equipment, uh, whether, you know, given uh, we have enough on hand and um, that just allows the, you know, kind of takes away that barrier um, for equipment uh, to participate in sports. So for Bacha, we would loan things like Bacha sets, um, ramps. We do have a few ha head pointers on hand as well. Um, power soccer, we, our main thing is those uh, power soccer guards and, and really specifically now driving that um, universal guard that's been developed. And then for pair ice hockey, things like the sled and the sticks. Um, and this is just a $100 um, annual fee for the year. And uh, so really, I think that works out to $8 a month. And um, then there's just a loan agreement to sign uh, just so we can keep track of where the equipment is, um, as well as becoming a sportability member, which is ranges from 10 to $25 a year. Uh, with Botcha, we've also done online stuff. Uh, so this has definitely been COVID times where we've developed some things um, and that have been fun to experiment with. Uh, so Botcha Battle is, is actually, there's a Botcha Battle app that's free to download. And what we did was offered a virtual uh, tournament. So it's almost like a video game Botcha tournament. Um, so for those of you kind of into the sport, but we can't get out and, uh, and meet right now to try it. Uh, you could download the app and learn a little bit. Um, and right now, I think mid-May, Manitoba is going to uh, offer a botch battle tournament. And then we're going to offer one uh, again later on. So we're trying to kind of um, chat with uh, other provincial partners to offer these tournaments. As we found, people really enjoyed playing against others across Canada. Uh, and then the Bacha at home, we just wrapped up and, and again was, was a great hit. Uh, so that was Bacha programming via, via Zoom, uh, what we called Bacha at home. And that was in partnership with Manitoba and Alberta as well. Um, and we had a great turnout. We had some new faces, which is great to see. And then it was nice to see some uh, familiar faces as well. And uh, it was neat partnering with the different groups just so we can have a leader um, leading each group based on age and uh, skill or development level. Uh, so that was great, really successful and um, something we're looking to offer again and probably going to continue to offering once we can even meet in person. Um, so that was that was great. Uh, power soccer, uh, you can see there's some similar things that's offered outside of weekly programming. Um, so I won't touch on the triads and the multi-sport days development camps because we already talked about that. Uh, but typically there's a store, what's called the Storm Tournament in Vernon, which is run by one of the clubs. Um, and that I think happens in the springtime usually. We have our provincial tournament uh, where because of the numbers of uh, power soccer clubs and participants in BC, we invite our friends from Alberta to come play um, and it's always great seeing them. Uh, so they usually travel down for that and uh, yeah, have a great tournament there. Uh, and then again, provincial team training camps, uh, the loan programs, and then what we did online for both power soccer and para ice hockey was had skill skills competitions. So we asked um, people to submit videos of themselves performing uh, their sport specific skill, and then we kind of we had a Facebook voting, um, and whoever got the most likes won a prize. So uh, that was that was a lot of fun too, and it's something we might look to offer again. Um, just to keep people engaged during these times. Uh, with pair ice hockey, um, what's different than the other two sports is we usually have a Vancouver and, and Surrey program uh, monthly game days. So we would host a game day in Vancouver one Friday, uh, in, in one Friday of the month, and then we would host a game day in Surrey one Friday of the month. And that just allowed for a bit of a change up between um, 
the weekly programming of uh, drills and activities and scrimmages and would kind of give that more competitive um, opportunity and play a full on game with referees and uh, have fun out there. Uh, another big thing is our sledge hockey showdown fundraiser. Uh, so we usually do this each November and we have different uh, community groups participate in this uh, fundraiser. So we've had the Surrey firefighters, neuromotion physio, um, MMP accounting, et cetera. And they've all participated in this tournament. Um, and it's quite, they all, there's always, it's, it's such a good time and, and a great fundraiser for us where they play a three on three tournament uh, during the day. Um, it's, yeah, it's a lot of, it's all, I think the games are usually about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and uh, yeah, they just have fun while raising uh, money for Paradise Hockey Programming in BC. Uh, we also have usually a silent auction and uh, things like that at the uh, fundraiser as well. Um, different from the other two, two sports, we have, instead of just the provincial team, we have a development uh, and a provincial team. So the difference between those are the development might be people that are looking to maybe eventually play on the provincial team, but uh, just need that more, you know, more time to develop their skills uh, to get there and, and have fun. Um, and in usual years, the development team will go to a tournament in Alberta uh, in March, and uh, the provincial team um, will train for that uh, national uh, championship, which moves around provinces. Um, so they both have training camps leading up to their respective tournaments. Uh, and then again, the skills, what we've done online uh, with pair ice hockey is a skills competition. Uh, so same thing as the power soccer where people put videos and posted and we see who got the most likes. So that was good, good engagement activity. So ways to get involved with sportability. Uh, our, our presentation typically focuses on athletes. Uh, but as mentioned in the beginning, there's a lot of people that come into play um, in ways to get involved that help develop and grow the sport, um, which, you know, we separate or sorry, we um, focus on, uh, you know, those those different positions for um, athletes participation and having a good experience with that. So getting involved as an athlete uh, really is the main one, but also as volunteers. So um, I briefly touched on you know, the program partners, um, referees, classifiers, uh, event volunteers. So you can see even that top right picture, there's the scorekeeper um, who volunteered for that uh, tournament. Um, and yeah, different, different, all different ways for that. Um, and we really rely on, on volunteers to make our program successful. Uh, so yeah, that's a huge one. Even with um, COVID, you know, with when we were able to get on the ice, um, for para ice hockey, we had volunteers that helped the programs run and, and, and now a health safety officer, which just ensured everyone, you know, who attended the program completed their, um, online symptom screening and things like that. So there's a few more volunteer positions that we needed to fill, um, when we were doing at times this year in person programming. Um, I talked about hosting a try it. Uh, so, and that's kind of that community engagement piece as well. So that picture, we went to a school, um, there's a student there that has a disability and we were able to introduce Bacha to her whole class. So that, in, so that introduced that inclusive play um, and was really neat experience. You can see how excited all of her classmates are too, even uh, to participate with her and, and um, play and learn a new sport of Bacha. So the triads, um, I talked a little bit about even the outreach where, you know, we can meet on the ice with a, a group or we can go to either a clinic or a school program or really anywhere where there's a group of people that are looking to try the sport and just what's most accessible for them. Um, and then also ways to get involved, program partners. So I talked about the different um, the different people that we connect with to make programs happen, whether it be municipalities, um, you know, partners that are um, our community championships, or sorry, champions, um, and different volunteers. Uh, but also when I say program partners, I'm also thinking about those that we partner with to um, like the Disability Foundation to 
get adapted sport out there and the awareness out there. So other groups um, that offer different adapted sports like wheelchair sports, uh, wheelchair basketball, we've partnered with at different events or different presentations um, just to kind of give everybody that um, information or, or the experience uh, all together. So I have this slide up here because I talked a bit about classification in the beginning, uh, but also there might be people on the call that are interested in being a classifier. Uh, so this just gives a, is a good visual from World Blotcha uh, that gives a little more information about classification, who can be a classifier. Um, so typically, you can see from this slide, a classification panel um, consists of uh, for, for athletes, they consist of uh, medical classifiers, so often a physiotherapist, for example, and one technical classifier uh, that can be a qualified coach or biomechanic with experience in the sport. Um, usually our classification panels consist of um, about four classifiers uh, that kind of have the different skills and, and they give their assessments and classification for each sport is different. So I talked a little bit about Boccia, how there's uh, from open, open class all the way up to uh, BC5. So there's BC1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and open class. Um, and then in power soccer, there's two classifications. Um, and then in para ice hockey, there's not really a classification process unless you're competing to be on the national team, um, where basically you, need, you just need to have a lower body impairment. Um, so again, I want to reiterate too that um, we don't necessarily worry about classification to come out to a multi-sport day or a triad event um, or even some of our tournaments. Uh, classification is just really for people that are um, going at a competitive level uh, or for a competitive tournament. Uh, I also want to talk a bit about coaching. So. Um, a nice silver lining to uh, these COVID times is that we've, because we haven't been doing uh, in-person engagement, we've been able to focus on some things behind the scenes, um, which are, you know, are helpful for uh, development, whether it be coach, referee, uh, athletes, or volunteers. So one of the things we developed is our Sport Abilities Coach Masterclass. Uh, and really the reason we wanted to uh, develop this program is just to have a place that is easy um, to follow and refer coaches to uh, that will allow them to build uh, their confidence and proficiency to become a strong sport leader uh, while also implementing safe sport environment in uh, one of our identified sports um, or more if people are involved in more sports. So um, we're really proud of, of this resource and it's really we've laid out um, different pathways and whichever pathway a coach is seeking, we just help them through that with different uh, coaching uh, resources. And uh, a lot of them are the, are the NCCP coaching courses. So um, if you'd like more information about that, you can look at our website uh, under our resources for the coaching masterclass, uh, or you can email me and I can help you out there. And then we've also, uh, in the past, we've created um, a, co a coaching resource for fair ice hockey, power soccer, and uh, botcha. So these sources are all free on our website. Um, they're PDFs online uh, that are really great for introductory for drills and activities that focus on building fundamental skills uh, for each, each of these sports. So um, they're great for new coaches or program leaders as a good start and, and uh, really teach people how to progress with um, skill development. Uh, so those can be found on our website there. And this uh, is just a, a couple screenshots of our para ice hockey resource for uh, reference. Okay, uh, I think I've covered most things or what we want to capture today. Uh, but if you have any questions, you can email me at jadeworger at sportabilitybc.ca. Uh, I also encourage you to follow us on our social medias. Um, so on Facebook, you can look up Sportability, uh, Instagram and Twitter is Sportability BC. Uh, and we also have a monthly newsletter that you can subscribe to uh, if you go to the contact uh, tab on our website, which is www.sportabilitybc.ca. 
thank you, everyone. Um, I can take questions if there's people live right now, but again, if not, feel free to uh, send me an email. Okay, I've. Uh... If anyone has any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask away. <laughs> Hi, it's Angie. Hi, Angie. Hi. Uh, how long is the hockey, hockey, um, Paralympics hockey? Uh, do you mean how long is the each program weekly or the oh, season? Like periods, like one period, two periods, three periods? Yeah, so it's just like stand-up hockey, uh, where typically we'll play uh, 15 to 20 minutes per period. Um, so it depends on the tournament and, uh, and the game days. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Is anyone else? Lawrence, do you have a question? Um, can you see my face or no? Uh, no, but it's okay because... <laughs> Why is that, do you think? Uh, let's see. I can't, let, I, I just... Start, oh, start a... my video. Hang on. I pressed to start my video. Oh, there we go. Okay. We can see you now, yep. Oh, I can't look at myself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can keep it off or on. It doesn't matter. Okay, I'm I'm really interested in para hockey, mm -hmm. and where where would I where would that be happening? Yeah, so um, whereabouts are you located? I'm in West End of Vancouver. Yeah, so the Vancouver para ice hockey program would be uh, probably the, the closest one for you, and that usually takes place at Hillcrest, um, at the Hillcrest Arena, and that's on fr usually Friday nights. And uh, what's kind of neat about that program is they have a beginner session uh, right before an intermediate session. Um, so they, uh, they offer um, two programs that, uh, yeah, if you were looking to, to get out there and try for the first time, then I would recommend the beginner session uh, for you. And uh, right now those programs aren't running with uh, COVID, but hopefully this fall we'll be able to get started again. Uh, and that's all through registration through the city of Vancouver. So that's not through your organization? No, it... so that's one of our, we partner with them. Uh, so they run it as a city program. So who would I contact, do you think? The, the uh, you can look at um, the City of Vancouver website uh, under the recreation, or you can contact me and I'll uh, directly contact you with the programmer uh, in Vancouver for information. Can you give me your email one more time? Yeah, uh, I'll share my screen again just so you can see it. I'm going to go with Angie. Great. Thanks for coming, Angie. Thank you. Good work. That's sport again. BC. Okay. Great. And yeah, there's, there's uh, on our website, there's a programs page and that lists all the programs uh, that are active. Um, so if you forget, or if there's people um, out there listening that would like to look at our programs, you can find that on our website under programs um, and it'll list the different programs and their locations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there, so that is not happening now then, I guess? No, uh, it's not happening. It didn't happen this year in Vancouver uh, with the COVID restrictions, and uh, but hopefully this fall, so typically September, October, that's when the program starts up again. Okay. So you say it starts in September and October. Um, do each of the locations where these programs are happening, do they each have different um, start and end dates for certain programs and availability or do some of them have drop-in or I was just wondering how it works yeah no that's a great question yeah they so each program's uh, different it depends on um, yeah they might start at different times um, they'll happen on different days and yeah they do have different structures so uh, with COVID we um, had the registration in place 
uh, because we needed to contact trace um, and make sure people completed symptom screening uh, before they attended the program. Uh, but there are some programs in a normal world uh, when they are at a drop-in base and then some are registered. So that, that all depends on um, the program structure and uh, which, what works for that program. Okay. Um, and the other thing for the equipment, I would assume that each um, program and location might have a limit to, you know, how much equipment that they have. And then maybe um, that might uh, be sort of restrictive with the, um, with the programming. Is there like rental fees or um, program fees? Yeah, so uh, that was where I talked about our equipment loan program, uh, which can be found on our, on our website as well uh, for more information. But that program's there um, in place for uh, like just those reasons you listed. Um, if a program doesn't have enough equipment to support uh, their members, we can loan it to the program or we can loan it to an individual. Um, so if that individual just wants their own set to use, at a program or event, um, or if they're in a community that doesn't have a program, but they want to uh, participate in the sport, then that's where the equipment loan program uh, really comes in. Um, and the fee for that is uh, through Sportability is $100 annually. Um, so say you were renting a power soccer guard, um, that would be a $100 annual fee to have that guard. Um, and whether that person, you know, you could basically could keep that loan going as long as we don't uh, need it or um, as long as that person's using the equipment. Um, but eventually it's, it's usually a good idea and if people are really sticking with the sport, if they can, um, they'll get their own equipment just because it, it makes that sport experience uh, much better um, having your own personalized equipment. But uh, our guard, or sorry, our equipment loans for all the sports um, are there as, as a, a way to uh, get people involved um, if they, you know, if they don't have their own equipment right away. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? I've, I've really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. And um, yeah, if, if there's any questions, um, feel free to contact me. Email's the best way right now as we're not, uh, we're working from home a lot of the time. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out about anything. Okay, great. Okay, I think that's a wrap. Great, thank you. Thank you very much.